Uh, in fact, you're watching passes from uh, Flanders, Hu, and Rossi from last November. They're seen flying right up here. Uh, they performed the first coupled landings using this production J-PAL system. Uh, the F-A-18 was used as a surrogate. Uh, I'll now pass it off to Flanders. You're going to have to bear with him. He's a newly minted dirty hinge and recently had a lobotomy. Thanks, Bojo. It, it still kind of hurts a little bit. Tuesday was a sad day for me. Lieutenant Commander Michael Ross, call sign Flanders. Uh, it was a VFA 115 JO. Uh, got the lucky ticket, as Pojo did, to go to the Naval Postgraduate School before going to test pilot school. And uh, it's, it's been an incredible ride so far. So I'd like to take a few minutes this afternoon to tell you about something that, uh, as an LSO, I'm really excited about and has generated a lot of buzz in the past couple of months, and that's something called Magic Carpet. Believe it or not, Magic Carpet is actually an acronym, and props if you can read the small print up at the top of the screen uh, to, to spell it out there. I'll, I'll buy a beer for anybody who can recite it to me at Bug Roach. <clears throat> but I'm really excited about it. Um, it's a combination of flight control laws and HUD symbology, up, up, HUD symbology upgrades to the FA-18 ENF Super Hornet and EA-18G Growler that I really think is going to be transformative for naval aviation for us in the next few years. Uh, to illustrate the effect that it's going to have, let's first talk about why landing on the ship is difficult. So from the very get-go, we're told that we need to juggle three things behind the ship. Meatball, lineup, and angle of attack. And to do that, we're given three tools. Longitudinal stick, lateral stick, and throttles. The problem is we have a really convoluted control scheme to make all of these things work out, right? If you have to make a glide slope change, you've got to add power and influence the nose. If you want to make a lineup change, you've got to roll with lateral stick while adding power, while influencing the nose. And the same to keep yourself on speed or to work off that fast, right? So we've got this mess of spaghetti up here that makes the carry landing task hard. One of the driving forces behind Magic Carpet is we want to simplify that. Meatball, glide slope, controlled strictly by longitudinal stick. Lineup, controlled strictly by lateral stick. Angle of attack and throttles, managed for you by the flight control computers. There's another piece to this as well. Right now, we fly glide slope using thrust, right? So when we want to make a change to glide slope, we move the throttle to affect engine RPM, to affect thrust, to affect lift, to change what we really care about, which is glide slope. So we've got a really, again, convoluted way of controlling what we care about. And one of the driving forces behind Magic Carpet is instead of using thrust to control glide slope, we use integrated direct lift. We start moving the flaps and ailerons faster at higher bandwidth to change glide slope using lift as opposed to using thrust. So now you move the stick to affect lift to affect glide slope, and it makes it a lot simpler. So here's how this works. This is vi uh, video from our manned flight simulator up in Pax River, where we've been developing this system. Down at the bottom, you see uh, two kind of vertical bars there. That's the throttle position, left and right throttle in the Super Hornet. And then that kind of cross plot next to it is the stick position. So take a look at those as we hit the video, uh, as we get the video going here. And I'll start talking about the second piece of Magic Carpet was the, upgrade, the upgrades to HUD symbology. So it's a little bit hard to see, but there's this green line in the bottom of the HUD that for those of you familiar with the F-18 HUD isn't there right now. That's the glide slope reference line. And it's designed to give you one more tool to judge where you are on glide slope. We're still using the eye flaws as our primary reference for glide slope, but this gives you another piece to make it work out a little bit easier. Add to that a ship reference velocity vector. So if you fly the Super Hornet, and you tell me that you're not already essentially deck spotting with the velocity vector, you're lying. You just don't know it. So we're finally giving you the tools to do what we've always wanted to do from day one, which is just put the thing on the thing, work line up, and land. And let me tell you, at least in the sim, it works really, really well. But that's just the point. At the moment, this is a simulator-only program. We haven't put it in the jet yet. However, last week, Boeing finished the flight control laws for the flight control computers. We're going to start putting them in the jet later this year, and we're taking it to the boat for the first time in February of next year. We expect to see the same performance that we've seen on the simulator trials behind the ship. And if that proves out, we're really excited about what that means for the future of naval aviation. So going from the back of the ship to, uh, to the bow, one of the other systems that we're bringing out is the Electromagnetic Aircraft Car uh, Catapult Launch System, or EMALS. EMALS is essentially a rail gun that we're going to build into the, the bow of Ford in order to provide the next generation of catapult launching systems. So it's essentially two lines of what we call linear induction motors, or giant magnets, that we energize in sequence to propel, propel a giant metal sheet down the cat track. And that giant metal sheet is attached to the shuttle above the deck, as we expect. That's a really, really capable system. 
One of the most interesting things about it is that there's no water break anymore to stop the shuttle at the end of the cat track. We just take those same linear induction motors and we run them backwards at the end of the stroke to stop the shuttle in its place. From the pilot perspective, it works exactly the same as steam. Same procedures, same ride. The only difference is there's no steam. So here's Butters Radishak. He's our new uh, carrier seat ability department head. He did the first emails catapult shot back in 2010 in the Super Hornet. There's his glorious shot right there. Uh, we've tested it in the Super Hornet, in the EA-18G Growler, in the Joint Strike Fighter, the T-45, the Legacy Hornet, the E-2, and the C-2, and it's performed incredibly well. One of the best parts about this system is that it's truly a catapult for a digital age. So unlike Steam, where you just charge up an accumulator and let it go, this system knows what its acceleration profile should look like. If you lose an engine after the holdback release, or you happen to be that unfortunate T-45 student who tries to go down the cat track with his parking brake set, the, jet, the, the catapult recognizes the loss in thrust or the increase in drag and will increase power to subsequent motor blocks to ensure that you get the end speed that you're supposed to coming off the end of the ship. So it's an incredibly, incredibly um, advanced system. In fact, it's the most advanced catapult in the world right now. So as a carrier suitability LSO, it's been an amazing opportunity to get to work on both this program and Magic Carpet to really be able to take our engineering background and our interest in, uh, in all things geeky combine that with our tactical background, and really hopefully influence naval aviation for, for the better through our work. Uh, I can tell you that it's been incredibly fulfilling uh, individually, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So with that, I'm gonna pass you off to uh, Lieutenant, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Commander Select, Rossi Robinson, who's gonna talk to you about the electromagnetic uh, solution that we've got for the back of the boat in AEG. Hello, I'm uh, Lieutenant uh, Brent Robinson, and uh, I'm a West Coast Hornet baby. I did a few cruises uh, with first and finest as a VFA 113 out of Lemoore, uh, and then I picked up TPS and, uh, and came straight to VX 23. First program I'm talking about is uh, <coughs> affectionately known as AG, but it's the Advanced Arresting Gear. So think of it as um, the uh, corollary to what Flanders has talked about emails, except on the back side of the ship. AG is designed to drastically reduce the maintenance and the manning costs uh, for operating a ship. Um, and it's going to be on all of our next generation aircraft carriers, starting with installation on the Ford coming out in 2016. How does it work? It's an electromechanical uh, rotary system vice the current hydraulic ram system. So just watch a little animation here. You see the two spindles on either side paying out as the aircraft catches the wire. Uh, what does this mean for us as aviators? Well, it means less heat, grease, and steam uh, for us and the gear dogs that operate the gear and for those poor chief petty officers that usually live in between the engines on the O3 level, uh, uh, between the engines. Uh, interesting to note on the AG, look at that. There's two separate halves there. They're not connected, right? Current hydraulic ram system is connected all the way through. So this uh, system is designed to independently but cooperatively pay out the arresting cable on each side so as to reduce the stresses on the aircraft and the arresting gear assemblies itself. Uh, currently, the AG is being tested up in uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey, the garden spot of the Garden State, let me tell you. I spent a few, uh, few weeks and days up there myself. Um, what is it doing? It's doing jet car testing. So before we can get an aircraft on it, we have to test it somehow. So what they do is they strap a huge honking uh, rocket on the back of a lead sled, and they fire it down a two-mile long straightaway, and releasing it, and then it, it engages the wire uh, itself, simulating an aircraft. Uh, not a bad job uh, if you can get it. Uh, so that's AG. All right. F-35. Mm. I got a couple questions for you. Who here has heard a rumor about F-35s at any time? Anybody? Anybody hear a rumor? Okay, here's my second question. Who here has heard a positive rumor about F-35C? Yeah, not many hands, right? Um, in all reality, uh, yes, there are challenges, uh, but I defy you to name a single DOD acquisition program of this size that doesn't have challenges. And honestly, that's our job to discover those challenges, and that's why we get paid. So we like that. All right, um, what I want to tell you that is not a rumor is that CF-3 is back. That's the carrier suitability test aircraft. That's the third C variant made. Uh, the ITF and the entire uh, JSF team uh, is hard at work uh, executing carrier suitability testing every single day. They work in Monday through Friday and many Saturdays uh, trapping the aircraft at PAX. 
they're currently in the middle of their structural survey. So structural survey, Pojo talked to you about shake, rattle, and roll. So structural survey is shake, rattle, roll on steroids for new aircraft. So normally when we do shakes, it's for a specific system or uh, component on aircraft, but a structural survey is for a brand new aircraft. So think of that six degree uh, glide slope landing that Pojo showed you. Now take that six degree landing and put that at a level attitude instead of on speed and then hit the, hit the ground. Uh, I, I can tell you they're, uh, they're not comfortable for the pilot or for the aircraft, but uh, that's how we test those corners of the envelope for a brand new aircraft. All right, another interesting uh, fact regarding carrier suitability in the F-35 is what's called Delta Flight Path. Uh, think of it as a direct corollary to Magic Carpet. It's the same conceptual idea of landing at a ship. The flight control surfaces are providing that direct lift, so you have that direct connection to the glide slope and the ball, while uh, the system itself maintains that quote-unquote ideal glide slope for you. That's how the F-35 is going to go to the ship. That's the option. Uh, and that's how they're going to put out to the fleet. And it's working pretty well. Currently, the F-35 is scheduled for the first trap on the mighty USS uh, Nimitz later this fall. And uh, honestly, is well on its way to achieving uh, its goal of cruising seven seas as the Navy's first uh, fifth generation fighter. All right, X-47B. Yeah, it's a robot. Uh, and it's a robot that can land on the ship. Uh, and honestly, I think uh, Skynet is here for you uh, Terminator fans. So what is X-47, UCAS, U-Class? You've heard all these acronyms around. UCAS is X-47, Unmanned Combat Aerial uh, System. X-47, UCAS is a demonstration po program only, uh, and it has two vehicles at Northrop Grumman built and stage out of PAX, and they're there to, to demonstrate that we can do this. In the future, they're going to be sitting on a stick in, in front of a museum. Maybe we can get one sitting over here where the Sears is in a couple of years. U-Class, on the other hand, is, uh, is the program that's actually going to be the operational unmanned aerial, uh, unmanned vehicle that integrates flawlessly, I'm sure, with the air wing and the strike group as a whole. So that's going to be the actual aircraft that we're going to see. In the last year and a half, the X-47 has successfully executed four uh, shipboard trials uh, on two Nimitz-class carriers. Uh, first starting with uh, just in the basic touch and goes, then rolling into nominal traps with nominal winds, think 25 knots down the angle. And the next trip uh, expanded that wind envelope up to what you would expect for a normal uh, pointy nose uh, aircraft. And then the last trip, just finished up about two weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, on the Teddy Roosevelt, demonstrated the ability for the X-47 to trap, clear the LA, fold its wings, and thus beginning the process of really demonstrating that an unmanned aerial vehicle can integrate with the carrier air wing. The X-47 is autonomous, which means it flies pre-planned, uh, pr uh, routes and profiles that can be updated uh, real-time by an operator. It's not a salty J.O. with a joystick sitting in his sleepy hollow stateroom trying to impress his, uh, his squadron mates there with a perfect three-wire three wire rails pass. It's not that. This thing does it on its own. Well, sort of. This is the actual control room on the ship. Um, what you're seeing here is a control room of an actual, while it's actually flying at the ship. Um, it actually takes a triple wide full of engineers and aviators to properly monitor and control this aircraft. That's where we're at right now. So to sum up UCAS, U-Class, uh, these systems are, aren't going to be the magic robot uh, launching AMRAMs in the fight, in the dogfight, as part of the, the, uh, the division strike package, like you see in the movies in stealth. Although it would be pretty nice if uh, Jessica Beale was up there flying with us in a flight suit. Um, instead, they're gonna be, they might be our eyes and ears as the ISR platform that's out there covering our butts. Uh, or they might be our tankers. These are the kind of ideas that we're thinking of for the unmanned uh, mission and how we're going to integrate them. Better yet, think of them as man's best friend. Essentially, they're going to be our hunting dogs. Seriously, though, the uh, inside view of the trailer tucked deep inside the hangar bay of the carrier and nowhere near the flight deck uh, really brings home how far this technology has come. Two, one, two, three, four years ago this didn't exist and we're landing unmanned air vehicles on ships. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a huge part of the future of naval aviation. Thank you. I'm going to pass it back to Hubuki.